So I've been asked today to talk about the retinal capture of the macular carotenoids. And this is based on my basic biochemistry work. And I'll be going over initially just past work that's been done over the last uh, 20 years, actually. It's been about 20 years since I first met uh, Fred Katchik, uh, one of the first people I ever met when, in terms of the carotenoids. And I've been working on that, on the problem of how carotenoids get into the eye. And then we'll talk a little bit more about what we can learn from this work and where we can go next in terms of uptake into the eye in certain animal models and into, into infants also. So we'll, try, we'll touch on that too. So as has been amply covered here, there are many, many carotenoids in nature, six or 700 of them in nature. And, but we only consume about 50 or, 60 percent, 50 or 60 of those in our diet. So that's the first level of selectivity. It's just what we eat. Of those, not everything's absorbed, as we just heard from, uh, from Dr. Katchik here. So only about 20, 15 or 20 of them are actually absorbed. Other ones just pass through or, or are destroyed in the gut. But only two, lutein and zeaxanthin and their metabolites actually make it into the eye. So this is a very extraordinary level of selectivity in a tissue. And this, is, as a biochemist, this has always fascinated me. And that usually means that there's some very highly specific proteins involved in the uptake. And that's been the goal of my, of, of my projects, is try to understand the system, why this unique process is going on in, the, in the, the primate eye. So we know, as we've heard today, that there's a hundredfold gradient of the carotenoids in the, going from the macula to the periphery. So there's specificity spatially within the, within the eye. And, with, and then there's chemical specificity, as we've heard the, the ratio of lutein to zeaxanthin to mesozeaxanthin in the, in the blood and in our liver is somewhere in the range of 3 to 1 to 0. But in the peripheral retina, it starts to change to 2 to 1 to 0.5. And by the time you actually get to the macula, it's 1 to 1 to 1 of, these, of lutein to zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin with smaller amounts of some of these oxidation products like oxolutein and epilutein that, and other metabolites that occur in the eye. So, and then, we also see this specificity here, again, um, of the deposition within the eye, the macula being much, much higher than anywhere else in, the, in the, the peripheral retina, iris, lens, and ciliary body. So how does this occur? Well, when we, I started working on this problem, there really was no, no idea. People just said, well, it's found in the, in the membranes. But membrane deposition doesn't usually explain high specificity. So you needed to look at, how do other animals solve this problem? And these usually are carotenoid binding proteins. And these were already well characterized by, uh, by people like George Britton and other people here. And the, the, most, the one that's best known is the one crustocyanin, which is the, which is the, uh, the astaxanthin binding protein responsible for lob the color of lobster shells. When you boil the lobster, the protein is degraded and the astaxanthin is released. And you see it as the red color of astaxanthin crystals here. So how do, do humans have similar sorts of ways of doing this? Well, we knew at the beginning of this project that there were a lot of carriers within the bloodstream, the high-density lipoprotein, low-density lipoprotein, albumin, and lactoglobulin. But none of these are very specific. They do bind carotenoids, but they're not a high-specificity binding protein. And what would these binding proteins do, the high-specificity high ones? Well, they could be obviously be responsible for the selective uptake of lutein and zeaxanthin from the bloodstream. They also could be responsible for stabilizing the carotenoids in the macula. We know the carotenoids, the levels of the macular pigment don't change very quickly. They change on the order of weeks or months, not in days. They don't vary nearly as much as the serum does. And they may be responsible for the metabolic interconversions that are going on, these uh, uh, postulated enzymes that might, be, that might be responsible for production of mesozeaxanthin. And then finally, they may facilitate the antioxidant and protective action of the carotenoids themselves. So the initial work that we did was brute force biochemistry, taking literally hundreds of donated human maculas, grinding them up, doing classical chromatography, uh, density, centri density centrifugation, until we finally got a, a, a relatively pure preparation from human maculas that was enriched in carotenoids and had only a relatively small number of proteins present on the gel. And from those gels, we could identify the, the, uh, the first of the carotenoid binding proteins, and that was GSTP1, and that's shown, and that was published here. And you can see from how you would isolate GSTP1 
we, we had found this as a, as, a pos, as a possible protein, but we had to actually prove that this was the binding protein and that it actually did bind carotenoids. And as you can see here, what we would do is, again, even classical biochemistry, where we would take GSTP1 or similar proteins here, and we would add in zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, or lutein, and we would look to see how much is specifically bound to the protein. And typically, when you found a binding protein, you're going to see saturation, um, can, uh, saturation equilibrium binding here. The more you add, eventually you see more and more binding until it reaches a saturation level. And we could find that with GSTP1 that it did exhibit sa saturation and specificity for both zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin, not so much for lutein. In fact, lutein was down here in the noise, and albumin could even beat out GSTP1. And then you also have to prove that if you think you have a binding protein, you also need to prove that it's in the right place, that it is actually in the eye, in the macula. And in, this slide was shown earlier today, but we could find that the GSTP1 was there, and you can see this strip of red here, because we had stained the, the photoreceptors with green. But you can see the strip of where the binding protein is. And that corresponded quite well with the classical position in the, inner, in the Henle fiber layer of where these carotenoids were. So we had solved where, that zeaxanthin was associated with GSTP1. It, it turned out that finding the lutein binding protein was much more difficult. We knew that there was a lutein binding protein. We could see this in partially purified extracts, that there was saturation that we could find in, a different, uh, in different uh, fractions coming off of our preparation. But we never could get it purified enough to identify the protein. We hit a bottleneck. We, could, or we hit a roadblock. We really couldn't figure out what this was. So we had to get creative if we were ever going to solve this problem. And so we had to look at how other animals had solved this problem. And at the, one of the International Carotenoid Society meetings years ago, I ran into Kozo Tsushida, who's a Japanese researcher. And he had been working on the same problem of binding proteins and, how, and metabolism, but on silkworms. And silkworms eat a lot of lutein. They eat it in their mulberry leaves that they eat. And depending on whether or not they have certain proteins, um, you can have uh, silkworms that make yellow cocoons that are lutein rich, or you can have silkworms that have white cocoons here. In other words, they don't absorb the lutein from their gut, and they also secondarily don't deliver the lutein. They, they can't deliver the lutein to their silk gland. And using classical, using genetics, molecular genetics, because you could at least breed all of these silkworms, he was able to figure out that there was a binding protein responsible uh, for, for the uptake into the eye. And it's something that he called CBP. And CBP is a STAR-D protein, which stands for Steroidogenic Acute Regulatory Domain Protein. It's a class of proteins that bind small hydrophobic molecules, such as carotenoids, cholesterol, all sorts of other things like that. And he had isolated CBP, showed it was in the silkworm gut and in the silkworm, and in the silkworm silk gland, and that when you incubated it with lutein, it would specifically come out as a yellow protein, and that was shown here. So the question would, that we asked, and it was somewhat of a long shot question, is could the same process with a similar protein be going on in the human eye? And so the first step we did was just taking an antibody to the silkworm protein and seeing if it would label a primate retina. And indeed, it did. It was right in the inner segments, a little bit into the Henle fiber layer, but mostly here in the ellipsoid region, which is the mitochondria-rich area here. So we at least had something to work with. We, see, we, we at least could see that there might be a star D protein would be the first class of proteins that we would want to look at for a lute, as a lutein binding protein. But there are many star D proteins in the humans. In fact, there, were there are 15 that are known. And they're all shown here in this plot of who's, who's in what family. And so we had to figure out is it which of these is most similar to the silkworm protein, which is found in the retina, and then actually prove that it could bind carotenoids. And we did, we queried databases using the silkworm sequence. And we found that of the 15 proteins, there were two good candidates that were, the, that were by far the best that showed about 30% homology between the silkworm and the human protein. And that was star D1 and star D3. Next, we looked at to see which of these proteins are actually in the retina itself. It turns out 
star D1 is not found in the human retina or in any other, in a mouse retina or anywhere else. But star D3, on the other hand, is. And it turns out, as we'll see in the next slide, it's higher in the macula than it is in the peripheral retina, which makes it a good candidate to be a lutein binding protein. It's also found in the RPE choroid, which is okay, as I've, uh, there are carotenoids in the, in the RPE choroid. Very interestingly, star D3 is absent, or at least in very low levels, in the mouse retina. An animal that we'll touch upon more does not accumulate carotenoids in the eye, so that at least is a possible reason why the mice don't have any carotenoids in the eyes. Maybe they don't have the right binding proteins. And then it was not found in the, in the liver either. And shown here is the western blot. Shown in the human macula, we see a strong, uh, a strong labeling of star D3 at the right molecular weight. In the peripheral retina, it's present, but at much more lower levels. In the mouse retina, it's not present. And then we were able to look and see that, indeed, it's in the right areas of the retina, in the inner, in the inner retina here, and extending into the Henle fiber layer. So it, again, it matches up in the areas that we would expect. And then we have to show that it actually binds, that star D3 binds carotenoids. Now you could, we, I talked about the classical methods of equilibrium binding. That's a very tedious method. You have to do overnight incubations. You generate dozens and dozens of samples. So we have upgraded to using methods called uh, surface plasmon resonance, which allows you to look in real time the binding of your, of, your carot of your ligand of interest, the carotenoid, with the protein, as long as you can make, get pure compound, pure protein, because you can immobilize the protein onto a chip here and it'll then look at it, pass, pass your, uh, your ligand in a capillary over there, and using the surface plasmon effect, which is proportional to the binding to the protein, you can see in real time, instead of incubating overnight, you can see it going on in seconds. You can then take the ligand away and see it coming off. And from that, you can generate what the, what the affinity is for your, of the ligand for your protein. And shown here is zeaxanthin. You can see with increasing, one, increasing concentrations, you see stronger binding. With mesozeaxanthin, again, we would see stronger binding. With lutein, we just see noise. Oops, I don't know what that's about. That probably would say no. <laughs> uh, let's say no to that. OK. So uh, we were able to get star D3 in high, in, high pure, in high purity. And from that, we were able to do surface plasmon resonance studies using star D3 using lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. It's not, we don't, we're not showing mesozeaxanthin here. But again, we can show that star D3 binds zeaxanthin a little bit, but it definitely likes to bind lutein much more. And that's shown here. And from this, we can then compare human serum albumin to the silkworm protein, to GSTP1, the zeaxanthin binding protein, to star D3, and generate all of these equilibrium binding constants. The constants that are the lowest are the best. That shows the highest affinity. And what we see here is that human serum albumin is all in the one micromolar range. This is not, these are all, they're all about the same. This is not very good binding. With, with the CVP, you can see that there's one that stands out, lutein, much, much lower. We're now down at 0.18 micromolar, 180 nanomolar. That is much better. And that's very consistent with, the, with what's known for the silkworm protein. With GSTP1, it's even better. GSTP1 is a, very, is a pretty tight binder, down around uh, 100 nanomolar. And it has absolutely, as far as we can tell in terms of binding, no distinguishing between zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin. But it doesn't like lutein. It doesn't like the other ones relatively. And then star D3 is at 0.45. So it's a lutein binding protein, not quite as good as the silkworm but it, is, it qualifies as that. So based on all of our binding protein studies, we can break carotenoid binding proteins into three different classes. The first one are the class one, the selective high affinity binding proteins that we define as with a KD below 0.6 micromolar. The ones that we know that qualify for this are GSTP1, the silkworm binding protein, and STAR D3. There probably are many others. I would suspect that crustocyanin would fit into that same category. Various other microbial and plant proteins probably do also. The second class are the non-selective ones. Those are the medium affinity ones, and they have KDs of between 1 .5, around 1 to 5 micromolar. Those are albumin, star D1, crystallins, IRBP, some of the other ones that we've shown. And then there are the ones that have essentially no affinity, 
You can do avidin, immunoglobulins, denatured proteins. Those are the control proteins that we work with. So what we know, as was recently published in the last few years, that STAR-D3 does fulfill the, the essential criteria to be a binding protein. It's a macula enhanced on western blots. It immunolocalizes to the right area, and it binds uh, lutein with high affinity. And, that, and just shown here is what STAR-D3 looks like. And in the next steps, we're really trying to characterize this protein much more carefully. We're obviously collaborating with Julie Maris on, on looking at its ro possible roles in AMD and in macular pigment de deposition. And I also have a new collaboration where we're begin beginning to crystallize these proteins with the ligand uh, on it. And we've, do we've successfully done that with GSTP1, and we're about to, get, to try to get some crystal structure. And we're hopefully going to have crystals soon of STAR-D3. So, what are we going to do next? And that's what I'll get to a little more forward-looking part of the talk here. So we're going to look at, as we said, binding, at, the, at the crystals of the binding stroke, binding ones, looking at AMD. But we're also going to talk about mouse models and understanding comprehensive uh, carotenoid transfer, transport, especially possibly in young, in young people. What we know is that tissue delivery is in part probably mediated by binding proteins. This is what we learned from the silkworms. But there are many other parts of the process. There's also, deposit, there's also delivery through the gut, and, and there are gut transporters, things like uh, SRB1 is involved in the intestine cell. We know it has to make it through the liver. We know it comes to the blood. It has to be delivered to the RPE, which is probably also an SRBP-mediated um, process. If it comes in in this direction, IRBP, which may be involved in the transport from the RPE into the, into the cells. And then finally, the other thing that we'll talk about is we also have to consider how are these broken down? Is there, some, is there roles for some of these metabolizing enzymes, BCO1 and BCO2? So one of the things we wanted to address was the question of why don't mice have carotenoids in their eye? We've talked about animal models, and Fred did some great work on monkeys, but monkeys are really expensive. Mice are inexpensive, and you also have all these models where you, can, where you can have tr uh, models of AMD and all sorts of things. And people have been using feeding carotenoids to mice for years. And there are literally dozens and dozens of papers that people have fed carotenoids to mice, and they say, we get some effect. The question is, is it actually getting in the eye? And the, the answer is no. They've, based on what we know, ne they never delivered any carotenoids actually to the eye. And so we wanted to figure out a way to humanize the, the mouse eye to essentially create a macular pigment mouse. And so how are the ways we're going to do this? Well, we're first going to try to just get, they're, they're not very good at picking it up from the diet. So we needed to figure out ways of trying to get it into the diet better. And we looked at a lot of different methods, looking at various oils, various other ways of solubilizing it, using captosol complexes, and then using a DSM proprietary method called Actilis. And from that, we did gavage feeding, we did put it in their drinking water here, and, we even, and then we also did beadlet chows with the Actilis methods. And from that, oops, I want to go back, we found that the Actilis method was by far the best. That was the best way. We could get uh, tissue, serum levels that were equivalent to what you might see in a human, but we still weren't getting it into the eye. The next thing we tried to do was try to introduce the binding proteins. Now, mouse does have some GSTP1, very little star D3, so using transgenic methods, we were able to introduce human GSTP1 into the mouse eye. And you can see here, we got it into the photoreceptors here. It doesn't quite get it exactly where it's not in the Henle fiber layer, but they don't have a Henle fiber layer. The problem is, once we did this, still nothing in the mouse eye. We still didn't get it right. We could not get any carotenoids in. Star D3 mice are still in production. So the next, but. The next step was to look at, how, at other animals. And certainly it was known in sheep and in chickens that if you, have an, if you have a mutation in BCO2, they can start accumulating carotenoids into their tissue. So you can have yellow flesh sheep, you can have yellow leg chickens, various, and you can get cows that make yellow milk are the ways that that mutation occurs. So our hypothesis is that maybe there's something about BCO2 in the mice that's really ripping up the carotenoids. And so effectively, we want to see, we hypothesize that BCO2 might be the problem. And we knew that BCO2 is present in the mouse eye in quite, in quite large amounts. 
but we wanted to see can, BCO2, can mouse BCO2 cleave carotenoids, and is it any different perhaps than what's going on in the human eye? So we were able to get bacteria that had a plasmid that allows them to make uh, zeaxanthin. It was, it, it's not possible to do it with lutein right now, but with zeaxanthin. And then we introduce a new plasmid in there that brings in a cleavage enzyme. And that should change the yellow, the yellow uh, bacteria to a clear bacteria, to a white bacteria. And we found that indeed this is true. In a control bacterium that makes zeaxanthin, they are yellow. If you introduce mouse BCO2, it cleaves all of the carotenoid and leaves them as white bacteria colonies. Very interestingly, human BCO2 is an inactive enzyme in terms of cleaving, lutein, uh, in terms of cleaving zeaxanthin and presumably with lutein. They stay yellow. So we wanted to then find, can we knock out mouse BCO2 and get better uptake into the eye? And so we, we were able to obtain and breed a number of different knockouts, BCO1, BCO2 knockouts, and also the double knockouts, BCO1 and BCO2. And we fed them high doses, uh, high doses of, of carotenoids, the equivalent of about six grams per day in a human. It's still high. And then we looked at their serum, their liver, and their ocular tissue. And we were able to just show this is how we genotyped these mice to see whether they had BCO1 or BCO2 knocked out. And from that, this is well known that, there's, that, the, that these mice now take up lots of carotenoids. In the wild type, you look at their tissues. They've been fed the carotenoids. They have the normal color of the mouse uh, gut here. But in the BCO1, BCO2, or the double knockout, they're all very, very yellow. And what did we find? Well, in the, in the serum, instead of the, nor the, the levels about 100 nanograms per milliliter, if you knock them out, if you knock out one or both of these enzymes, we definitely see significant increases in the carotenoid level in the serum. We also see increases in the liver, uh, even more with these. And in the RPE choroid, we're starting to see more coming in. And what happens in the retina? Well, you can see that in the, in the wild type mice, there is no zeaxanthin, even when you feed them a lot. If you get knockout BCO2, we see large amounts. And if you knock out both of them, we see unexpectedly that it doesn't work as well. We're still trying to figure this out. The numbers are still small. And what happens with lutein? Well, with lutein, again, BCO2 is more important to knock out. If you knock out both, you get very high levels in the serum. And if you look at the amounts in the liver, again, knocking out these enzymes helps. In the RPE choroid, more is expected if you knock out both of these enzymes. So you see very high, you see very good respectable levels of lutein in the, in the, in the retina. And then or that's in the RP choroid and definitely in the retina. So we're now at least getting to the point where we are humanizing the mouse retina and do, allowing it to develop, uh, to get lutein in the, in the retina. And now we can ask the more interesting questions in light damage models, in, molec in genetic models of, uh, of AMD. Does this make a difference? And that's just so summarized here. So that's the new frontier that we have of now being able to develop some mouse models of, of carotenoid levels in the eye. In the last five minutes, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about macular pigment in infants and how it may be delivered and what may be the difference between lutein and zeaxanthin in these models. And some of this work was just published a few months ago, and the other work was actually published this morning in IOBS. I just got the... <laughs> I got the email on that. So why should we know, think about macular pigment in children? Well, we know that diseases of aging, such as AMD, may depend on light and oxidative stress that accumulates over a lifetime. And there's also important questions that the macular pigment, which we know appears pretty early in life, that that might be important on visual uh, function and influence foveal development in very young children. And then there's also the question that needs to be looked at, could carotenoids, which are very good antioxidants, be important and modulate the risk of retinopathy of prematurity. So the problem is, how do you measure macular pigment? We heard, lots of we heard some talks today on doing flicker photometry. Well, you're not going to do that on an infant. It's, no it's just not going to work. You have to use other methods. We heard about HPLC. That's too invasive. Mothers are not going to give up their children for that uh, sort of assay. Um, autofluorescence, which is one, another method, is, uh, is, possible, is not possible because they don't have any fluorescence in the back of their eyes. So you need to do either reflectometry or resonance Raman spectroscopy. And so we developed a reflectometry method using the RETCAM, using the blue light source here, which overlaps with the macular pigment. 
And unlike the challenges of reflectometry in adults, you don't have to worry about, um, about the, re the, reflection, the media, the lens, causing changes and, and making it difficult. So using the blue light, we can see the macular pigment here as a dark spot. And from that, we can quantify the macular pigment here using, using the reflectometry method. And, and then we can also do resonance Raman spectroscopy, not on the eye because the light levels are probably too high, but we can also measure what's going on in the skin as a surrogate instead of getting blood levels, at least in future studies. And that's just showing our method of, what we, of how we measure the macular pigment in the skin, which is just a, a one minute test that can be done on the, foot of the, on the foot of the child. In our first study, we looked at 51 infants and children and measured their macular pigment and tried to find out their levels. And I'll finish up within a couple minutes here. The, uh, we found that the macular pigment correlated, the method seemed to work well, the, correlating the right eye with the left eye. You see a very good concordance, as you would expect in these children. We found that macular pigment does increase with age. This is what was predicted, but this is the first time it's ever been done, looking at 51 infants aging from prematurity all the way up to age seven. And you could also, just going back, note that the premature babies have essentially no macular pigment, and that was a very consistent finding. And we also found that macular pigment correlates with the serum lutein and zeaxanthin in these children. And the, and the skin carotenoids likewise change here with skin carotenoids increase with age. So that's, that seems to be something that changes with age. And finally, that uh, skin carotenoids correlate with total serum carotenoids. And finally, the first time, again, we don't usually see this correlation in adults, but skin carotenoids is a good surrogate marker for what's going on in the macular pigment optical density in these children. And the latest one that was published just this morning is we looked at macular pigment in newborns, in babies at their, in their first two days of life. And from that, we found that the mother-infant, looking at the mother-infant carotenoids, that they correlate mother and infant serum, lutein and zeaxanthin. This has been thought to be true in the literature, but this shows very clearly. And we found that infant zeaxanthin, not lutein, this was a little bit of a surprise, that the serum zeaxanthin predicts the infant's macular pigment optical density. That's shown here. And this is true, it carries on, it's very consistent. Even the mother's zeaxanthin predicts the macular pigment optical density of their baby at birth. So it suggests that Doing, that changing the mother's diet or giving supplements could allow them to, to have an increased macular pigment optical density at birth. Whether that's important, we need to find out and do future studies. So um, that's really where I want to end up here. We've talked a little bit about mesozeaxanthin. Mesozeaxanthin has been covered very well. We, our goal, at least for the next two years, I didn't quite finish all my homework that I gave myself last time. <laughs> We are very, working with Fred Katchik, we're very actively trying to find the enzyme. We have some clues as to, as to what the substrate may be, what the enzymes might be in the eye. And I'm very hopeful that we will understand how that process occurs in the eye uh, in the future. And so I want to acknowledge everyone who's worked on this project. And in the very last three slides, I'm going to promote my conference that's going to be a year from now at the International Carotenoid Society in Utah. It's, uh, for those of you who don't know, Utah's here in the western US. It's actually very easy to get to from Europe because there are non-stops from Paris. It's kind of lost on there. And this shows our conference facility. We'll be able to accommodate up to 400 people. So it will hopefully be a big conference. And please, if you come, see the rest of Utah. There's many fantastic things to do before and after around the state. And we'd love to have you visit. Thank you. I think John just wants to make a quick announcement yeah. before yeah. we... We'll, we'll make an announcement. Sorry. Also, yep. we get to talk about your conference maybe in more detail. I yep. think we should make more time for that because yep. it's important that we understand it. Just one quick announcement before we go to the final question and answers. The, at lunchtime today, once you're finished your lunch, which will be served downstairs, the tea and coffee is served across the grass where the poster viewing room is. I really encourage you all to go and look at those posters because the afternoon session will be fully dedicated to posters this evening. We've over 30 posters to get through in the afternoon session. So have your lunch and then stroll across the grass and have your tea and coffee across that way. So sorry, thank you. Okay. Can we have some questions now to Dr. Bernstein? Or do you want lunch? Uh. Uh. <laughs> See, here. 
They're keeping us from why, why doesn't mice have, have these, uh, n n well, uh, luthien knockout uh, uh, proteins anyhow? Why don't, why don't, well, they have, they have BCO1 and BCO2. Why? Why do they have it? Yeah. Why do they not like carotenoids? Actually, it's the fact, the primate levels of carotenoids in the bloodstream and in their tissues is relatively unique, I think. I think most, most animals, and we've examined many, uh, many farm animals, don't like having so much uh, carotenoids in their tissue. So why is, why is the human eye different and why are the humans different? I don't know. But their BCO2 and their metabolites may be used for other things and other things in signaling. But I think a bigger, a, a more, more of the question that I, I, one of the ones I want to address is human retina has a lot of BCO2. It's a dysfunctional enzyme. It doesn't, it, you know, everyone, BCO2 is thought to be a cleavage enzyme, and that's based on lots of mouse studies, but the human, human tissue, it doesn't work. It's doing something else. And, what, and it, it actually, we have some data that BCO2 binds oxalutein really well. We don't know why. That's actually one of, its pur one of its preferred things that it wants to bind. So there may be something there. It just goes to show that my, you know, when it comes to eye research and many other research, mice are not always like humans. Perhaps we'll finish at that point. And thank okay. you very much indeed. Okay.